Hello again, and welcome to ChessOpenings.com. Today we're going to look at the Grunfeld opening, which is a venomous reply to the Queen's Pawn opening. It begins with the moves Pawn to d4, Knight to f6, Pawn to c4, Pawn to g6, Knight c3, and then the signature move Pawn to d5. In the Grunfeld, Black rejects the principle of occupying the center with pawns, and instead he prioritizes rapid development and peace pressure on the center in order to see if he can create white some headaches as quickly as possible. Let's take a look. The Grunfeld is an aggressive response to the Queen's Pawn opening, so it usually starts out with the moves Pawn to d4, Knight to f6, and Pawn to c4, and now Black sets up the development of his dark squared bishop with the move Pawn to g6. Now after White continues Knight c3, he's planning to bring a third pawn to the center with Pawn to e4. And so now Black selects the Grunfeld by playing the move Pawn to d5. Now this move might look innocent enough, but in fact it's part of an all-out strategy to get at a sensitive point in White's camp, and namely that's the d4 square. So the Grunfeld is very much so a strategy which is built around trying to get at this pawn and trying to break it down. Eventually what Black plans to do is to trade off his d-pawn, which will open up the queen for an attack, and he's going to use his bishop on g7, and he's going to use peace pressure and pawn pressure to try to break down this d4 point, and we're going to get a chance to see that in just a moment. You could say that in the Grunfeld, Black is sort of playing a little trick on White. In most openings, both sides are going to fight hard to occupy the center with pawns, but in the Grunfeld, Black actually lures White into setting up an enormous pawn center with the sneaky ambition of attacking it later. This is a double-edged strategy which could end in either glorious success for Black or sometimes it can lead to total disaster. Now, the clearest example of the strategic climate happens after pawn takes pawn, knight takes pawn, and pawn to e4. When black's major aim is going to be to combine peace pressure and pawn pressure against the d4 point. And this leads to a really paradoxical area of chess strategy, which is that advancing pawns is generally a good thing. White has advanced two center pawns here, and this does a few things. This gives his pieces some free lines and squares, uh, it also restricts the enemy's pieces and pushes them back. And in the event of an endgame, it also means that White's pawns are a little bit closer to promotion. So these are three big upsides to advancing our pawns. But there are also downsides to advancing the pawns, which is that they invariably create weak squares behind them, since pawns cannot move backwards, and they're also the best defenders. So in this case, since White has moved both his e-pawns and his c-pawns, here he has a tender point on d4. So, in a way, the Grunfeld is kind of a, a battle between two opposing strategies. White says, I'm just going to take the center, and I'm going to enjoy the benefits of having extra central control and extra space. Black, for his part, is saying that I'm going to give you the center, but just for a little while, and I'm going to use the extra time to develop my pieces, and then attack the center ferociously, and see if I can break it down and leave you with all kinds of weaknesses. So. Both sides have a clear strategy, and they also take on a clear risk. Now, the position which we are showing after white has captured on d5 and played pawn to e4 is known as the exchange variation, and this represents white's most popular book line against the Grunfeld. From here, black now captures on c3, and white recaptures, and black completes his bishop fianchetto with bishop to g7 here. I think you'll notice right away that white indeed has a huge pawn center. His pieces have plenty of flexibility about how they can be deployed, and Black always has some funny problems finding squares for some of his pieces, because that pawn center, it controls just so many squares in this position, and it can also rapidly be advanced. For example, e5 or d5 could also always push some material backwards. But Black is positioned to assault the pawn center. There are plenty of ways White can play, and press for an advantage in a double-edged game, but for instructional purposes, let's focus on what happens if White doesn't think carefully about how he deploys his pieces next. Now, after the very reasonable developing move knight to f3, 
Black would play pawn to c5, and I just want to give you an example of how quickly white can fall under a typical Grunfeld attack. If he just lackadaisically plays bishop to e2, he's going to find out very quickly what it means to come under assault in the center, which is black would play knight to c6. Immediately he's already attacking that pawn three times, four times, I'm sorry, and this means that white has no choice but to defend the pawn. He has to play bishop to e3. If he simply advances the pawn, then black would win material with bishop takes c3 check, and the rook would also be under attack. So instead, white normally plays bishop e3 in this position, and now black can step up the pressure once again with bishop to g4, which threatens to win a pawn once again as one of the defenders is under attack. At this point, white has no choice but to play pawn to e5, which fixes his pawns in the center, and also weakens the light squares as well. And so now, black could uh, step up the pressure by first playing pawn takes pawn, pawn takes pawn, and then he would castle kingside, castles kingside, and now simply queen to d7, followed by bringing a rook to d8. And in this position, black already has something of an initiative here. He's developed his pieces comfortably, and white has weaknesses on a2, d4, and on the light squares. So this is already an example of just how quickly the position can come out of control for white. So, in the exchange variation, white needs to think about how to slow down black's counterattack. And he's got a few ways to do this. Mostly, he wants to pay attention to not allowing this light squared bishop to also participate in the attack. So, one very fascinating way to do this is rook b1. And this leads to a very sharp position. By putting pressure on the b7 pawn, white is making it much more difficult for black to eventually bring the light squared bishop into the game. Certainly, there are some antidotes to this for black. There's a couple of known methods which allow black to get an interesting, complicated game. But this is a very dangerous, very sharp position, and black has to fight very hard not to get into a horrifyingly passive position. Another way to cope with these problems would be to delay developing this knight on f3. For example, bishop c4 is known as the classical variation. And the idea of this line is that instead of developing the knight to f3, white is going to develop the knight to e2. And by doing this, he's always ready to counter the pin on g4 with the move f3. And this is also a very interesting strategy. White's just going to try to continue his development and build up an attack using the center. Another method of development is just to play bishop e3 early on into these positions. And the idea here is to first shore up things along this diagonal, usually by playing queen d2, and then either rook c1 or rook d1. And only later is white going to develop the kingside pieces, and in these positions he might even consider playing d5 at some point once he's defended c3. And he's going to try to give black as many headaches as possible before continuing its development. And this setup also has a lot of potential for white. So now we've seen a few ways that white can attack and put pressure on black in the exchange variation. Let's back up now and look at another approach for white, which is also very principled, and this is known as the classical variation. This one begins with knight to f3, and now black just continues development, bishop to g7, and instead of taking on d5, black plays queen to b3, putting pressure on d5. Now, of course, black could simply defend the pawn, say, with c6, but this would be very passive and not the kind of idea which we're aiming for in the Grunfeld. We want to use that pawn to attack on c5 later. So instead, black takes on c4, white recaptures with the queen, and black castles, and white plays e4. Now, in this case, in the classical variation, white center is a little bit more compact, and it's easier to defend. But he's already lost a tempo for general development since he's made a couple queen moves in this position, and it's likely that he'll lose some more time if the queen ends up getting chased around. For example, maybe a6 and b5 at some point gain some time for black in this position, or some other ideas. And black still has every aim of breaking down the center with the move pawn to c5. So this is a very popular alternative to the exchange variation since it has a little bit less risk. Black has moved a few less pawns in this position, but the center can still come under attack 
and we can see that the major idea of the Grunfeld, which is pressuring d4, still stands even in these positions. There are certainly a few other major strategies for white in the Grunfeld, but I hope this has given you a foothold on some of the core concepts of the Grunfeld opening. Now certainly as black, this is a very attractive opening for players who are willing to take some risk with black in order to look for a complicated and interesting tactical game where they have counter chances. On the other hand, I think that studying this opening as white is also a great idea since it can teach you how to safely and strategically advance the center and avoid creating too many weaknesses in the process. That's all for today, and I look forward to seeing you again.